and the feedback we're getting is like, yeah, it's really engaging and we enjoy it. The sound quality is great, the visual quality is great, and the presentation as such and the repertoire is really engaging. So, you know, what became a new practice or an experiment uh, in like late 2020 has now become a best practice. Sometimes when bad things happen, it can force you to make good changes. Stay tuned to see what one professional choir learned about themselves during the pandemic. Joining me from Edmonton is Michael Zog, Artistic Director of Procoro, uh, the premier uh, professional choir in Edmonton. Uh, and if you appreciate us making this content for choir leaders, please don't forget to like this video and to subscribe for future updates. And Michael, how wonderful to have you on the channel. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure, Tom. Thanks for inviting me. So before we get started to talk about Procoro, uh, let's talk about you just a little bit and uh, where you come from and how you uh, became the artistic director of, a, uh, I know you're from Switzerland, so you know, how did you become the artistic director of a choir in Edmonton, Alberta, of all places? Well, you want the abbreviated version? It's going to take quite a while to start in, I don't know, 1970s or 80s. Uh, well, thanks for the question. I think uh, what I always come back to when, you know, I think, well, how did I end up in Edmonton? Like, well, uh, I'm like, you know, small town boy, small town in the Swiss, uh, Swiss mountains. And like, you know, I'm now in the, in the prairies in Canada, close to the mountains. Because I do like hiking, I do like camping, I do like skiing, and I mean the weather outside is kind of you know it's nice and sunny. So who knows? I might get on the on the hill some sometime this winter. Um, eventually, uh, when I started out as like a, you know in my late teens, um, I didn't really know choir that much or what a choir was. So it took quite a while to actually first sing in a choir. So I was I think sixteen or seventeen. Uh, the first time I sang in a choir, but then it was like, wow, what's that? And mm -hmm. I was hooked and kind of uh, went on singing as much as I could and almost like every night, uh, you know, signed up for a choir and I tried like a jazz choir and a barbershop. I know you have a little barbershop background. Oh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a symphonic choir, chamber choir. Uh, but my first training actually is in as a school teacher. Um, so I taught at an elementary school, I taught junior high and kind of like the pedagogical element and, and my training as a pedagogue and my love for singing and my love for music kind of like merged at one point. And that right. was also the time when I went, uh, I travel around Europe as a singer in a couple of choirs, you know, those European youth choirs. And I met and I was exposed to Scandinavian choral music and that kind of like blew my mind. And I went to Stockholm. I studied in Stockholm and then that was 20, actually pretty much 20 years ago. Um, and my professor actually was a previous artistic director of Procore Canada. So he commuted from Stockholm to Edmonton. And he said, if you ever end up in Canada, you know, Make sure you check out Procore Canada in Edmonton and, you know, and eventually I did. And so here I am. Ah, uh, that's very interesting. I mean, first of all, I think um, that happens a lot. People get hooked. People who have not uh, ever done any singing when they first experience that, I think a lot of them realize this is amazing and I should do more of this. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Procoro uh, particularly uh, and, and your experiences during the last three years. Of course, it's been interesting uh, to say the least for everyone in the in the choral space but when we were speaking uh, to to sort of set up this interview you were talking about uh, particularly how um, it forced pro choro to look at what do we do and why do we do it and i bet a lot of people have been in that same situation uh, i'd love to hear what your experience was through that yeah um that was a you know uh, i don't even know how to start describing the moment you know where it happened and everybody looked around like what is going on like in our field or just across the world i do remember we finished our um banff residency a week prior to kind of like the shutdown here here in alberta and uh, we were actually hosting the elmer eisler singers who came from vancouver they were um performing, I think, with the Vancouver Chamber Choir. They traveled to Edmonton and we had a joint concert. And I already had prepared the choir that maybe 
we would have to do that concert on our own, depending on on travel, on mm -hmm. flight restrictions and whatnot. And that was uh, a week before then school shut down and kind of like public life shut down. So I remember that moment very vividly. Uh, then for us within Procore, there was a, a frenzy right after that because we have, uh, you know, uh, one concert every three to four weeks. So there was little time to, uh, uh, you know, readjust and decide what are we going to do? Um, is this just two weeks or is it going to be two years? Nobody thought it was going to be two years. So we were like, well, maybe by, you know, a month or six weeks from now we could be back. But then the decisions end. I mean, uh, you know, what was happening was very quick. No, we have to uh, shut down. We have to cancel. We have to inform our patrons, our uh, singers, our other contractors and just like put everything on hold for now. Um, a, a benefit to some extent, if you want to call it, that was uh, right prior in like mid to late 2019, Procora underwent kind of like a, a, a change in structure. And I was appointed not just artistic or kept my artistic directorship, but also was appointed a managing director. So the the whole role was under one hat, so to speak, which actually helped us in the in that period because we were able to streamline our uh, mm -hmm. productions, our organizations, our operations, and we did less work so to speak in terms of like being out there and being with with you know 40 audiences and presenting concerts and a lot was as with everybody else was remote work and working from home so we were able to kind of streamline that whole process um to you know kind of like we trimmed the sail right ahead of the pandemic by coincidence right. and that helped mm -hmm. us through the first phase definitely yeah. And so um, what did you, uh, what did you, I remember particularly you saying uh, something about how you had to go back and reassess why are we doing this and what exactly is it that we do and, uh, and to really reconsider that with the board and with, uh, with all that. And I would love to hear what was the outcome of all those things. What did you decide you were all about and how did it, how did it change you to go through that conversation? Yeah, there, there was a, uh, a great discussion happening, great discourse um, on the board level, but also with singers and actually with the staff. Uh, we were just two people in the office and we kind of looked at uh, all the research that was coming out. We started having roundtables with other professional choirs to see how they were dealing with um, even just contract things and their seasons and, and whatnot. And with the board, the discussion was, of course, like, what are we doing? You know, how do we, uh, as uh, you know, a performing arts organization, follow our mandate? So we went back to our mandate and said, "What is our mandate? What is our vision?" Um, and and one of the like the tagline or the you know the the philosophy is inspire our hearts, minds, and spirits of all who hear our professional chamber choir. And so I, okay, how can we, how can we do that? Inspire, I think inspire, uh, hearts. I always feel like when you are in a performance in person and you feel the vibration, the sound of a choir, there's a physical reaction in a listener, also in the singer and the conductor, but also most of all in the, in the listener. So we found like, the, you know, the heart part is quite tricky to do if we cannot be in the same room with our listeners. Now, we can inspire, you know, minds. So we thought, okay, how do we do that? Is uh, education, is that uh, engaging, you know, on, on discussions, is engaging on music making, but online, because that's more like a intellectual uh, activity. So those were some of the considerations that we had that also the board was discussing. We tried to source and research, uh, you know, uh, texts that were written at that period. Uh, you know, we looked to Europe. How is Europe dealing with the pandemic? How did the professional groups in Europe move forward? The research that was coming out from Europe and from, from the States. Uh, how did some, you know, uh, important figures, either cultural figures or other figures write about the pandemic and, and what they think would happen. 
And, you know, we were not really at a place where we would say, well, we think this is going to happen. So we were more like on the receiving end and then kind of how can we take that information and make it valuable and impactful for for Edmonton, for the choir, for our audiences. One of the things that we did first is we decided, well, everything has to be hyper local. Of course, we couldn't invite or bring in any guests from Europe or from from Asia or from wherever we had planned to. So everything was hyper local. And the first thing we did within uh, Edmonton and kind of like what we researched and went out and see with other people is like, what do you need right now as community choirs, amateur choirs, singers at home who would like work on Zoom or maybe would meet outside in a field or in a forest to sing together? What do you need at this point? And the feedback was, well, what would be very helpful is music that we can sing on Zoom or if we get together, just the four of us. So Procore commissioned eight composers over the summer of 2020. So that was the first summer of the, of the COVID to just write short works, three, four minutes, uh, very accessible. Most of the composers uh, took texts by Edmonton uh, poets. So everything again was hyper local. We could uh, interact with them again on Zoom or outside. And then we distributed this music through video tracks and learning tracks to the community. And over the course then of the of the summer and the fall, people really took to that and learned these new songs and they could just gather four of them, uh, maybe outside or over Zoom and, and try to sing these these new works. So that was one of the first kind of like outlets we had. So it was actually not necessarily for the choir or for our traditional audience. It was for other choirs to help them make music. Once we kind of, you know, looked at uh, like the hyper local, what can we do uh, for singers here in town, also for composers, because they lost, you know, their income too. Uh, we tried to bring individual singers you know, on camera to kind of still engage uh, our audiences, also for the singers to keep doing music, to keep making music. Also, one of our mandates as Procore is to hire professional singers. So we made sure we could actually, you know, put money into singers' pockets throughout the pandemic. Right. But the big thing that came out of that was, of course, something that has been within the performing arts scene before is like okay how do we get online how do we live stream how do we do that and i remember uh, maybe five years ago so about two three years prior to the pandemic start uh, talking about like no like our our thing is like live concerts that's what we do if you want to hear procura canada you, you just have to get your bum in a seat and listen to us and i don't really see how we could uh, do or bring that experience onto the screen. So yeah. at that point, we were like, well, we might have to. So we took about five months to research how other organizations, and those are mostly in the States and in Europe, are doing live streaming and uh, how, uh, what is their you know, technical capacity? Uh, what is their monetization model? How do they promote it? Uh, what type of content are they using? Uh, what is their audience or who is their audience and how do they reach their audience? Another element was that most of the models we found were either in the orchestral world or in the opera world. And those are very specific visual experiences for a viewer. In the opera, of course, you have a story, you have costumes, the singers are off book. That's what's what the opera is. Um, in the orchestra world, you have a lot of activity through the instrument. So there's a technical element to watching an orchestral performance on the screen because you might have the violin or the flute or even the percussion if it's kind of like a crazy piece. And orchestras and operas, of course, have more resources than just the you know, Canadian professional choir. So you have many more cameras and point of view aspects that you know are within the orchestra. So, what is the visual language of a choral performance? It's a very good question. And then we had to think. Well, you know, you have these choral performances that are kind of going into more choral theatre, 
uh, generally that's more youth and children choirs that you know sing of book they might have props they might have costumes they engage the audience more on a visual element and Prokoro is not our our traditional model is still our traditional model that we perform uh, we have you know our our outfits we have our folders uh, we don't have time to learn an entire repertoire from memory we do 10 12 programs per year so the turnaround doesn't allow to memorize you know 75 80 minutes of music so we had to account for those things I, I would think especially with the level of complexity of the music that you're choosing it would be impossible to memorize 80 of them yeah, Mamer, uh, again, coming back to that Scandinavian model I was referring to earlier, that everybody's on their own part if we do a piece by Prowlins or if we do Ligeti Lux Eterna or any other of the repertoire. So that is that is a challenge. So we have to think, what is the, how can we create a, a visual language around Prokoro and our audience and our venue. So we had to start thinking a little bit outside the box. So it's not just a straight on view of the choir. So we had, you know, okay, which team are we bringing in? What type of cameras do we use? Uh, are we adding other material to our live streams, like other visuals, other like short clips of something, overlays? So right. over the last, you know, two, three years, we started to refine that kind of approach to live streaming a concert. And at this point, you know, Procore Canada, like, you know, we do it off the floor. So there is no post-production. What you see is what's happening right now in Edmonton. There's like a 30 second delay, which is, you know, the, the, the internet. Yeah. Not. But other than that, it's, it's live off the floor. So we're not going back and correcting things or finding different angles. And I think that's really the engaging thing that uh, Procore is doing right now and the feedback we get from audiences we have audiences over in over 30 countries across the world and the feedback we're getting is like yeah it's really engaging and we enjoy it. the sound quality is great the visual quality is great and the presentation as such and the repertoire is really engaging so you know what became a new practice or an experiment uh, in like late 2020 has now become a best practice yeah, that makes sense to me. I mean, if the um, you talked about being hyper local because of the or starting that because of the pandemic, but but of course the other option is to be online and to be kind of global at the very same time. Um, and so, it, do you think that will stick? Is that something that Procore is going to continue to do? Yeah, it is part of our of our operations now. Like we have a hybrid presentation model. You can come to a venue in Edmonton in person and you get that experience. And there's six to eight cameras around you with about three people manning uh, or you know looking at the cameras and um, presenting that um, the other element to that is when you buy a subscription uh, to our our season you automatically get access to the live stream so it could happen that you know we get one of those winters a winter storm right. and you just don't feel like driving that night and you just stay at home you turn on your tv you connect to our tv channel get a glass of wine and you watch it from home or you <laughs> might you might not feel well either you know like maybe there's another wave uh, coming and we can then say well we're just performing we know how to perform fully masked three meters apart in a big venue everything is filmed and you can watch that or we now do you know normal normal concerts where we just like Prior to the pandemic, we're just on stage, unmasked and performing. And at home, you can watch that. Right, right. And that's been well received, the online uh, casting? Yeah, uh, people really appreciate it. They, uh, you know, comment on the quality of sound and image and also the, you know, the little extra things. We have maybe uh, an interview in, at intermission or introduction by a visiting composer uh, so there's other elements that you might not automatically get when you come in person because you know we, there's other things to do when you're in a concert you meet somebody you go there you go there but when you watch a performance online you're really focused to the content that is presented to you and we can cater that the other element of course that live streaming has brought to us is um, we now do rehearsals where we can actually, with the equipment we have, live stream within 15 minutes. 
And that's great for the singers because sometimes, or as you might know yourself as a singer, it's like, oh, well, I have the sniffles, but I'm going to just power through. <laughs> or yeah. Like, yeah, I might sit at the back because my voice is not great. Uh, but now it's like, well, we don't really want to get anyone else, you know, like get the sniffles and whatnot. So we can say, well, if you're really not 100%, you stay home and you're on the screen and you rehearse with us from home. So and we have to set up that we can provide that within a short period. So also for our singers and contractors, it's much more, it's easier just to be part of the organization now. So the whole operation really has gone online to some extent, not just the concerts. That's correct. And we also have started uh, to do some live streams of rehearsals when we do contemporary repertoire, just uh, go through a repertoire, explain like, you know, uh, extended vocal techniques and how we would do this. And we provide the scores online so a viewer can see a notation and then how is it translated into sound. Now those, you know, are more like a very small niche audience and right. it's mostly students or other conductors who are, okay, how do you do that? I just want to see this very particular piece of like extended technique and how does it sound? So it's not a general audience who watches a, a rehearsal on contemporary repertoire. Yeah, clearly, clearly not. That would be a small group of people. I think I would be interested to watch. I may, I may visit one of your live streams myself. So in the post-pandemic era, now that we, uh, you know, hopefully we have this behind us for a while, at least the impact on regular life is much lower than it used to be, uh, even though viruses are forever, I've heard. Um, what, what are your, uh, your challenges and, and plans for Procoro in the next few years? So looking ahead and kind of, you know, I, I sometimes say, well, we, we've came out of the pandemic and we're now post-pandemic and what are we doing now? Now, Procore was in a situation as a professional organization that we were allowed to perform uh, or work, let's say work, throughout the pandemic. There were only, I think, three months in total where we were not allowed to gather and do any type of work. But other than that, we were able to keep uh, our production schedule up, our present presentation schedule up. And so we started already with the 2021-2022 season with um uh you know like a full full performance schedule uh, everything was live streamed and then we added audience back so right now what we're doing is something that we have done kind of for for the last two years so it's not that we're now starting to you know get back to what we did before we are already in there and this hybrid model is is now become a practice that we just that we just do this is just part of what Procoro does with all you know it's it's operation implication and business implications and whatnot uh, I think one thing that is happening and uh, I believe many you know conductors and other you know managers who who like think about this and maybe watch this they have the same challenges of getting the audiences back um, and one element of bringing our audiences back, uh, we realize in conversation and surveys, it's not just like, well, it's, you know, it's, is it safe? Oh, you're singing on masks. So I'm not sure if I'm coming. So that's a very small percentage yeah. who says, I'm not quite sure yet to gather with bigger groups and where people are masked and, you know, are you checking vaccination, vaccination status? Uh, it's just that, you know, generally society has, has shifted to what is their, how do they spend their time on a weekend? How do they spend their time on a Saturday night, Sunday afternoon? Also with our singers, how you know are they doing their work-life balance? And I think that's something that the pandemic has brought into like a sharp focus, work-life balance. And so we see that with our audiences too. There's like, yeah, we're not like, yeah, we were prior to pandemic, we were like out every night and this concert and that event and, you know, hobby here and sports there. Yeah. And I was like, well, no, it was like we were we have a reset. We kind of like have to figure out how we do that. So that's something that we're working on right now. How can we build back audiences and maybe gain and track new audiences with an awareness of like what are we actually presenting and, and what can you expect when you come to a concert? So we also have to rethink a little bit the uh, maybe the repertoire or the present presentation style or the venues where we are at so people you know 
are not back in their old, oh yeah, on Sunday afternoon we go to that venue and we hear a classical choral concert. That's that's what was before, but now we have to think how we do how do, are we doing this slightly different to you know re re reattract the audiences, but also find audiences that maybe haven't heard or seen us before. So that's for us uh, one of the challenges and right. something that we're really working on right now. Right. Well, I'm so glad that uh, people like yourself are working on these problems, and I, I think it's wonderful how innovative uh, Procoro Canada has been through this whole situation, and uh, I hope that people watching can learn something interesting and join the conversation uh, as well. Thank you so much for watching, uh, and if you've enjoyed the content, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future updates. Uh, also, uh, it would be wonderful if you could share with me what are the topics of most interest to your group? What would you like to see me uh, do on this channel to interview people to give you the most benefit? Uh, and now, uh, we'll leave it there. My name is Tom Metzger and I hope your day is full of singing.